<laughs> it's time for the Christmas Eve edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 466. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And I'm Gavin Ashland, and it's December the 24th, which, as Kevin so wisely pointed out, is Christmas Eve. <laughs> Okay, welcome to the second taping of Anglican Unscripted, where we're going to hope to avoid the rabbit trails of episode 466, <laughs> take one. Now, it's a lot of fun, uh, the, the three-way format, and the three-way format allows us to really go deeper than I've ever seen, you know, just the two of us go, because um, we can have counterpointing arguments on the same thing where we're agreeing each with each other and not agreeing. It's fun to watch. And if it happens in the future, we'll keep recording. But at this point, we need to get out a Christmas Eve episode. And you don't want to sit down and listen to an hour and a half of three ge guys, geezers, three geezers talking on Christmas Eve. Okay, welcome back to the show. We want to thank you for being a regular viewer. Um, we need to grow the show. It's not fair that we just uh, have ourselves amongst the... Uh, elderly clergy people within the Anglican Communion and the the uh, young millennials. We want to expand as much as we can. Um, we have a potential audience of 80 million, if you really think about it. So it's time to go to the show, and we can't And, and only 40 million of them are cranky old white men. Yeah, that's uh. right. <laughs> and so we need to go beyond the cranky old white men. And so if you could share this episode, that would be really swell. If you could like it on Facebook and like it on Anglican uh, TV YouTube channel, that would be great. If you've not subscribed yet, subscribe. And if you want to comment, right there in the YouTube comment section, we have very nice Christian discussions all the time. Well, maybe not all the time. Not all the time. Merry Christmas, guys. How are you doing? Great, great. We had the pageant yesterday. We've got uh, service at 10 p.m. tonight, then 9 o'clock tomorrow. And then the rest of Christmas Day is on pastoral rounds to the sick and shut in. Hmm. A lot of fun, a lot of excitement. Gavin? Um, I'm looking forward to doing Midnight Mass on the internet because um, looking at my options, I decided that was the most responsible and creative <laughs> way forward. Kevin. Well, your whole family's at the house this weekend too, right? Yeah, they are. I wasn't sure. So I'm now not sure what counts as a rabbit hole and what, what counts <laughs> as, as, as a way towards um, a fruitful reflection. Um, but... Uh, my wife became a Roman Catholic during this last year, and so we go to church twice on Sunday. So I mm -hmm. go to Roman Catholic Mass, and I fold my arms, and I, I receive a blessing, which I'm very happy to do. Very interesting as a priest to see mm -hmm. the quality of the other priests who offer you a blessing. I'm, I'm not an Augustian Donatist, but, I'm, but there are some guys who really are full of the Holy Spirit, and when they bless you, they bless you. And there are other guys when you say, well, Lord, I, I missed that one. I hope you didn't. <laughs> so, um, but I've decided. But I said that on Christmas Eve, I you can only go to one midnight mass. There's only one midnight. <laughs> so I, I said, actually, I'm not going to church and <clears throat> not receiving Jesus. So I'm not going to Catholic midnight mass. I, the problem I have with the Anglican Church locally is not only is there a woman priester who I I don't think gives me Jesus when when she says her prayers because I don't think that's what the church has taught or understood, but. The local bishop has just suspended one of the best and most competent of the local clergy, a man who, when he preaches, I sense the Holy Spirit working very powerfully. And the local bishop has done it on, on the, and involved considerable injustice and considerable incompetence. And just at the moment, I don't think I have, having sat with him and listened with him and prayed with him, I don't think I could either easily roll up into this parish and on this holy evening of all and just just wander towards the altar and back again as if nothing had happened so i'm going to be celebrating off the internet and one of the things i i hear from people is there there are people who can't get out to church and they're glad for prayers on the internet at, at, at times of, of of importance and this is a maximum time of importance yeah, gavin are you Gavin, are you telling me that uh, this is the first time you've encountered incompetence and injustice in the Church of England? <laughs> oh, George, you lure me. You lure me into apathy. <laughs> There's a rabbit trail there. Don't go there. Don't go. I got to celebrate the traditional Coulson, the male role in a Coulson event. Uh, I volunteered to videotape the uh, children's uh, pageant yesterday. 
And I was all set. I grabbed my camera, I grabbed my tripod. Oh, it'd be great. And you know, all the kids will be excited to see a good videotape of their services. I show up and I forgot something. I forgot what every male Coulson has forgotten for the last 200 years since they were invented. They're called batteries. <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, no, oh, no, I look like a fool. I can't believe I forgot the batteries. So I, I recorded the whole thing on my iPhone. It still came out good. But, oh, good. you know, it's it's the Coulson tradition. And I remember Dad doing this. Uh, and I always get in trouble with Mom. Uh, most of my home videos of Christmas, if you play them on the little super eight player the little uh movie player they're in fast motion because he uh, recorded them with batteries that made the uh the camera go slow because they were worn out batteries and that Ke kevin i was fast yes kevin i was under the impression that the calls and christmas tradition for men was to lose a finger in the snowblower <laughs> that's what that's the other one yes <laughs> oh we have many a good tradition let's move on to the, what a great transition to news before we talk about digits um we talked about this before last week, both shows. We did the triple show and the double shows. We talked about transgendered baptism. Uh, it's a new, informal, yet uh, valid uh, option now within the Church of England where you can uh, have transgendered baptisms. And George made the important point, at least last week, that this is going to leave a mark. And I'm watching the clock. It's still news for 24 hours. It's still news after 48 hours. still news after 72 hours. Um, it does seem to have stuck as far as what's going to happen. I kind of want to see, is this the impact of uh, uh, crossing that red line that is finally going to be a catalyst for people to leave or not? And it'd be a great discussion. Uh, well, let's start with you, Gavin. George replies, just, just factually, we have to say that although you use the phrase transgendered baptisms, our, our, our critics will say that's not what they are, don't say that. Okay, what should we say? Well, what we should say is that the baptismal liturgy can be used by people who have transgendered to, re, to, to, to express their new identity by reaffirming their baptismal vows. The, what is the difference? Not a great deal. What they're still doing is they're using Christian liturgy for the purposes of establishing a new social and political and existential identity that has got nothing to do with Christianity or Christ and everything to do with, with if you like, a lateral or horizontal uh, sociological uh, expression. And, and, you know, those we object to, we object to the sacraments being used for that purpose. That's their wrong purpose. Okay, I didn't hear a whistle blow. Everybody get out of the pool. We're done. Uh, is there any good fight back going on in the Church of England? I'll, I'll, I'll jump into this because I don't, Gavin and I are not on the same page on this. I, say, I see the potential for a good fight back. We've uh, Nicholas Helen writing in the Sunday Times yesterday met, said that 10 bishops had spoken out against this, as had a number of institutions. And Kevin, as you've pointed out, this story is not going away. A we, uh, two weeks after it first broke, it's still in the Sunday Times. And the Telegraph did a rewrite of the Sunday Times piece. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Michael Nazarali, Keith Sinclair, Rod Thomas, Tony Robinson, uh, other bishops, I, uh, uh, Julian Henderson, we sp discussed last week, have come out against this. Now, is that evidence that the Church of England has now seen the light and everything will be wonderful and great? That's no, but there's the potential because they're not working in concert. They're issuing their independent statements they're all essentially going in the same direction. And I'm heartened to see something. Now, does this something matter at the end of the day? And this is where Gavin, I think, can jump in and say, does this even matter? Is it too little too late? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I'm tempted to go to a woman called Candace Owens, who is a Republican uh, black lady of uh, considerable articulation and insight. And recently she was interviewed by Rod Little uh, in the Sunday Times, and he he uh, had her up as personality of the year and he interviewed her as a previous black activist who had moved from being a Democrat to a Republican or, or in the UK terms had moved from being a progressive to a traditionalist, I suppose you might say. Um, and in the course of this conversation, one of the things she said was, Rod, I wish people would understand that the Third World War has started, only it's an ideological war and it's with cultural Marxism and it's life or death for our culture. 
And I, I was so pleased to hear a politician say that because, because the Christians ought to understand that that's what's happening too. Um, one of the things that we talked about in our earlier take, and I'll, we're reordering our material a little bit, if I can just go to it for a moment. Sure. Um, you know, I, I was asked by somebody I studied law with uh, 40 years ago, a woman who's now a judge, married to a judge, and they're Jews. And they asked me to have lunch with them recently to ask the question, Gavin, is it safe for us uh, as people at the top of the legal profession in the UK as Jews to stay in Great Britain? What do you think? If we have got to the point where um, the Hitlerian project, I mean, George, this is your point. You might want to make it. You made it better than I do. What, what, express this point, George. <laughs> Uh, the not the I'm not sure which point that you're referring <laughs> to that I made. Uh, pick, pick, Gavin, pick the better one that I made and go run with it, and then I'll hop in. Okay, so George, uh, um, the point that you made so eloquently earlier on, which which I was very moved by, and I'm still sifting through it. I guess very powerful was uh, Hitler appears to have won the Second World War because the things that Hitler set out to achieve appear to be happening. Okay, it's 50 years later in a slightly different guise, but the Jews are being expelled from Europe. <laughs> Freedom of speech is being cracked down. Uh, and identity, uh, totalitarian identity groups are triumphing over lesser identity groups. It just happens to be taking the form of cultural Marxism rather than ethnic fascism, but there's very little difference. So, um, what, so if, Hitler, if Hitler's ideas have triumphed, and one of the things we're saying is that there are so many similarities between German ethnic fascistic nationalism and, and Marxist totalitarian categories of uh, identity, or proletarian politics, there are so many similarities. Both intend to impose their categories of what is right and what is good and bad in human affairs in a totalitarian fashion that does two things. It drives out democracy and it attacks the Judeo-Christian ethic. Uh, and my point is that, that we are, we are, this is so far progressed. Candice Owens is right. We're in the middle of a war. Um, it, the things are, it's moving extremely fast. And it ill behoves Christians to do a Chamberlain at Munich and say, let's just be nice. I'm sure they want to negotiate a little further. I bet we can turn them around. But this, this, word, is, the, well, this is my Christmas sermon, Gavin. <laughs> are we the church of nice or are we the church of Jesus Christ? What did Jesus call us to do? What did cry to Christ come into this world for us to be polite and genteel or to repent? And turn, you know, repentance means turning around. Mm -hmm. And we have a church where institutionally in the Church of England and the Episcopal Church where repentance has no meaning uh, tied to the traditional under theological understanding of it. Well, now, for, for me too, Kevin asked us, Kevin, would you like to ask us what our Christmas sermons are again? George is asking. Oh, no, jeez. <laughs> That was episode uh, six, uh, 466, take one. That that really, uh, that was a rabbit trail. Well, my huh? sermon's going to be about 40 <laughs> minutes, so if you'd like me to start, I'll No, 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 no. But, no, but uh, Gavin, your point is absolutely right. Now, <clears throat> I, I, I do want to flesh it out one or two points. As an aside, I one of the people, I, my senior thesis in university, I was a history major, among other things, was on Oswald Mosley. And after the, he was the leader of the British Union of Fascists, he was uh, the, the Quisling of Britain, who uh, was interned during the war and had a rather disreputable reputation after having been a uh, government minister in the 20s. Well, who was one of the leaders of the pan-European movement in Britain? It was Oswald Mosley in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. He resurrected himself, mm -hmm. along with many of the uh, fascist and Vichyite and pro-Nazi collaborators into uh, people promoting a pan-European ideal. In their case, it was to fight the battle against Bolshevism and world Jewry. And if I look at Europe today, the battle against world Jewry, Jewry has pretty much been won. You have magazines like Der Spiegel, which is the German people magazine, being virulently anti-Israeli under the and 
they're not anti, they will disclaim being anti-Semitic, but the way they treat Israel is with all the stereotypes that would been a der Sturmer. If somebody told you that, 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 that an, uh, an MP in Parliament had to attend her party conference with police protection because she was Jewish, what century, what country, what year would you think you were in? The answer is you'd be in the UK in 2018 because that was what a, a socialist MP had to do. I'd like to imagine a conversation taking place between Dietrich Bonhoeffer and George Bell in 1931 because they knew each other and they were part of this passionate ecumenical movement which both represented faithfully and with good reason. And, and I'd like to... I, I'd like to suggest that, um, uh, that, that that George Bell might have said to Bonhoeffer, Dietrich, you know, calm down. Uh, we have such good ecumenical relations in Europe at the moment that, that, that politically we just need to get on a bit better and we'll be able to bring a great deal of leverage to against Mr. Hitler's project. And, and of then, course, uh, Germany is the most cultured, the most civilized, the most uh, gemutlich society in Europe. How could you possibly think that it would uh, fall within within the next few years into total barbarism. And let's credit Dietrich Bonhoeff with 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 preternatural foresight, which he didn't have, but he nearly had. And he would say, "My dear Bishop Bell, I promise you that in six years you will be driving to the station to collect our German Jewish children to save them from being burnt and gassed alive in concentration camps. That's how long you've got, Bishop." What are you going to do? Will you go and see Mr. Chamberlain and tell him that Mr. Hitler is not a nice man who, who doesn't do the things he says he's going to do? Now, I think there are so many similarities in the UK in 2018 with Germany in about 1931 or 1932. Your Antifa activists on, on, on American campuses are behaving in the same way, using the same language and the same techniques for the same reasons as the brown shirts did in Berlin. It's the same. The fact they call themselves anti-fascists mustn't bamboozle us into not recognizing that they are fascists and they are attacking democracy and freedom of speech. It, 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 the Christmas sermon is this. Christ came into the middle of the darkness to defeat the darkness, death and evil and to bring the human beings to life and to light. We are, more, we are first of all in a metaphysical struggle with evil. And if we don't take up our inheritance in our recognition of evil, our naming of evil and our dealing with evil, we will be overcome. There are moments in history when, when that becomes most intense and we're at one of them. Gavin, let me jump jump and take something that I read yesterday, uh, read today in the Times of London. The Times of London, Kea Burgess, the uh, religious affairs correspondent, had an article essentially that essentially said that Justin Welby should stay out of politics. And it uh, gave the results of a survey that said that uh, most people think Justin Welby should sit down and shut up, even though they agree with many of his populist opinions. Should Justin Welby sit down and shut up or, and not talk about the Trade Union Council, not talk about uh, all the various uh, things that uh, MPs get themselves up to, or should he be talking politics, which is justice, truth, freedom, protection of the Jews, and things of that nature? In other words, where do you stand on this? Where would you be? Okay, well, first of all, he has never mentioned protection of the Jews, so don't credit him with that, because that would change the argument. Uh, I froze a little, so I'll, I'll repeat it again. He has never talked about protection of the Jews. But, but uh, my understanding is that Justin Welby is a kind of theological Neville Chamberlain, uh, in, that, in that, so for the moment, uh, our progressive culture is Mr. Hitler. And he has gone to meet our progressive culture and to talk to it and come back with a note saying, we can trust our progressive culture and we can get along with it. We can do business with our progressive culture. Let's just accommodate ourselves a little more to its demands. He doesn't understand that our progressive culture is like Adolf Hitler uh, and that actually it has ambitions that will crush the Christian witness. He's making a very serious theological mistake and, his, his, and when Lambeth Palace answers in his name that Jesus was political and responded to political questions with political answers, he has made the kind of theological error that you would expect only in a rather dull adolescent. 
and I cannot believe a serious grown-up Christian can make in this day and age. Now, well, what about uh, blessed are those who do not leave a carbon footprint and Jesus' sermon about the farm bill? I, I remember those clearly in the Gospels, Kevin, don't you? Uh, recall Christ's intention, injunctions of how to vote Labour and uh, Democrat and everything. So you're asking about uh, uh, whether Jesus was political or apolitical. Jesus was clearly apolitical, but the Old Testament has been rewritten. And we remember George Orwell's famous quote, he who controls the past controls the future. Who, who, he who can rewrite history uh, can write uh, the future. And that's exactly what's happened. Jesus is no longer the savior of the world. He's been rewritten as a social justice warrior. He's more interested in climate change than your soul. He's more interested in making sure we have mosquito nets in Africa than he is in your soul. And Jesus has been completely rewritten uh, from his apolitical, um, obvious teachings uh, to what we want to find out in a church that doesn't want to believe, they just want to do. And that's where we are. If I can read out Lambeth Palace quoting Justin Welby, because mm. this, this, this is the heart of the difference between us, and build on what Kevin has just so clearly and helpfully said. So, so Lambeth Palace said the Archbishop's been asked to stay out of politics. His response is, that's not what Jesus did. No wing of party politics, left or right, can claim God as being on its side, despite the fact that Welby takes the left. But Jesus was highly political, and if we are to follow him, we must share his concern for justice for the poorest and most vulnerable. That is always political. Um, if Christians don't speak about injustice in society, it's tantamount to ripping out sections of the Old and New Testament. This simply is not true. Um, the, the difference is, if we go to Matthew 25, which is, the, the if you like, the socialist charter to, to back this up, uh, it's undoubtedly the case that we will be judged according to the level of our genuine compassion for people around us. But the socialist progressive movement delegates this to the state. And what, what Welby's position and the Church of England's position is, we must support the state when it takes these moral responsibilities away from the individual where Jesus placed them and turns them into state projects in the name of justice. What do we have from the mouth of Jesus? We have in the Beatitudes, for example, Matthew saying, blessed are the poor. Well, the, 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 that's a technical word in the Old Testament. And so Luke fleshes it out for Gentiles and says he means poor in spirit, okay? This is not a political manifesto, guys. If you're a Jew, you'd understand that straight away. But just in case you're an ignorant Gentile and you don't know who the poor are in theological categories, he's talking about the poor in spirit. They try and tap, t track him over, trap Jesus over tax and political and national issues. And he says, I'm not having it. He turns it back into a theological question. He says the poor you'll have with you always. He pays no attention at all to the restoration of Israel as a political identity, which everyone was concerned about, and talks instead of the kingdom of heaven outside time and space. I always wanted to be a Christian socialist because it was cool and easy to do and easy on the conscience. Uh, and because politics is easier to grasp than metaphysics. But actually to be in the spirit is to understand metaphysics and the spiritual. And politics is a cheap second-hand way out. And, and it's, it goes against what Jesus taught. And the fact that the archbishop can say with his left-leaning political values, as if he's holding the middle ground when all he is doing is parroting socialist propaganda, if, if he can simply say, Jesus was political and so I am, this is a very serious misreading of the gospel. Kevin, uh, well, am I correct in your uh, saying that the Archbishop of Canterbury's press office said that it would that uh, the actions of are tantamount to ripping out sections of the Old and New Testament? Yes, that's what they said. Um, well, uh, that takes us back to the transgender uh, issue because I, I'm pretty certain that the the Church of England has ripped out sections of. Romans and sections of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and uh, some of the uh, epistles on human sexuality that uh, I can remember when I was a young, uh, I was, I came out of the Diocese of Pennsylvania and uh, Charles Benison was the bishop, new bishop at the time. And he famously said, and I was there when he said it, the church wrote the Bible, the church can change the Bible. 
And Justin Welby seems to be in the Benison mold of basically saying that we can make this mean whatever we want it to mean according to the ideological flavor of the day. And that's the difference here. The Bible says, feed the poor, feed the widows. When a modern social justice warrior reads that, they say, ooh, the Bible says, make the poor middle class, and they set about doing that. That's not, you know, that's the rewrite. That's the misunderstanding of the nature of Scripture. When it says, blessed are the poor, if you want to go back to the, the Greek, it means congratulations to the poor. You are Candace blessed. Owens quite rightly said that yeah. one of the jobs of the progressive politics is to marry the poor to the state. Mm. That's right. And to replace, to replace the father in the family with the state. And one of the things that neither Welby or the Church of England seems to recognize is that the glorification of the state that there are, to whom they are delegating ethical responsibility that belongs to individuals is in fact to displace both God the Father and biological fathers. They just don't get the bigger picture. Um, one of the things that, as George quite rightly said, it, it, when it comes to sexual ethics, is that, that we are a purity movement. Um, the children of Israel were trained in purity from the very beginning. Sexual purity, uh, marital purity, national purity, political purity, economic purity, but always purity. And although this word has been hijacked by charlatan movements, often political, it remains at the core of real Christianity. And the interesting thing is wherever we've had revival, one of the things that, the, that, that, one of the things that characterized the revival was a quest for purity. Look, for example, at the wonderful Wesley and the whole holiness movement that, that, was, that, was, uh, that it embodied. Um, we, you cannot just, you cannot rip out all the passages on sexual purity of the Bible and say, we're going to buy in instead to the luxury of individual self-pleasuring preference, which is what the Church of England is, is accepting. Gavin, let me pull it all the way around because you never answered my question. Uh -oh. Which is, is this, uh, these, are these 10 bishops who have objected to the transgender moment in the Church of England, uh, does it mean anything? Is well, George, or, or are yeah. these, or is this the start of, of, uh, of a revival? What do you think is happening? Um, of course, I don't know, and we, and, but we'll soon find out. If what they are expressing is mild discomfort, then they won't be in the news next week or the week after. If they are expressing uh, the, disc the holy discontent that Luther expressed when he began the Reformation that was so needed at the time, they will say, I stand here, I can do no other, try me, put me on trial for my fidelity to the gospel. Well, George, if they do that, we've got a, 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 a big moment awaiting us. At the moment, I fear they may just be expressing a little bit of discomfort. Well, but uh, here's where I want to go. The English either speak a type of English I don't understand because when uh, this whole Gene Robinson thing came about, there was a certain um, archbishop who lived in a nice Pacific island or an island uh, here. It was the Pacific Atlantic Ocean island who said, this is going to tear at the fabric of the communion. He didn't say this is discomfortable. Oh, we'll get over it. His words were much more specific, much more dynamic, and much more dramatic as to what is going to happen. And guess what? There was a tear in the fabric of the, of the communion once and for all. And I'm seeing this type of thing within the Church of England. I just don't see the English bishops and clergy standing up and say, this is going to tear at the fabric of the Church of England. Well, may I jump in here and say, in 98 at the Lambeth Conference, the Church of England bishops by both basically kept to the sidelines uh, during the heated debates over human sexuality. There were Americans and there were Australians and there were Africans and Canadians who were very, and South African whites, who were very vociferous on both sides of this issue. The Church of England bishops mostly stayed aside and then George Carey, as Archbishop of Canterbury, let it be known that he, where he stood on this issue. And then the bishops of the Church of England trumped in in line and backed it. I'm wondering whether there's a leader, uh, whether the Church of England institutionally, because Justin Welby has laid down the course, no other, no, the bishops are not going to break ranks, or whether there's a possibility that 
we'll have a pleasant surprise that at the end of the day, Welby will marshal the troops and say, this is the time that we need to act. Well, the trouble is that the, our, our theological opponents have been politically much cannier than we have. They knew what the plan was 20 years ago. And like, like I'm sorry to bring up Hitler again. It's true that if you, you bring Hitler to any political conversation, you've lost already. But there's a historical reason for this. We've been talking about it. Um, the fact is, in, in the same way that the ambitions of the German state were laid and prepared a long way ahead, so the ambitions of the progressives in the Church of England have been laid for some time now, and therefore there are no there are no people holding episcopal office in the Church of England who hold the views that they would need to hold if they were going to kick back. They've been either weeded out, or, in the case of some of the good men who secretly hold those views, their appointment has been made conditional on their not expressing them. Rod Thomas, bless him, is only a, is kept on a very short leash indeed, or he would have been louder and clearer before this. Bishop of Birkenhead has done his very best, but he's tired and there's only him. Uh, the Bishop of, of Fulham from the Catholics has gone over wholesale to the project. Uh, the Bishop of Blackburn appears to be uh, in two minds. George, we both gave him the benefit of the doubt last week, uh, but he's not done anything to earn it since. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you were right, but but there's nobody there. So so the only people who are going to do this are going to be outside the House of Bishops. Um, and the question, will they do it at all? How much does it matter? How clearly do they see the issues? What do they need to do? What, what environment needs to... How do we prepare the way? How do people pray for, for reform? How do we lift up and support leaders what needs to be done or have we reached the point that that amie uh, your diocese those are the ways forward i mean well, uh, people, is the institution salvageable we probably need to leave this as a cliffhanger we've just hit 35 minutes guys oh my so, word <laughs> <laughs> so what we'll do here is now, but see kevin and when you preach a sermon you've got to tell the you've got to come to a conclusion it's okay now go out and do likewise <laughs> what are we telling the people to go out and do uh, after right. this sermon? Go, of go, and love, go and love Jesus on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. love, love him with all their hearts. Receive him. Let him be born in them again. And then let the birth of Christ and the Holy Spirit direct them as the spring comes. We'll, we, can, we have time to, to discuss this further. But now we go, we go and we worship. Amen. I want to thank you guys both for giving up the busiest day uh, uh, of December. Clearly, uh, to, no, to that start was yesterday, the show. Kevin. Pageant day. Pageant, pageant day. day. Oh, I did the pageant with the low batteries. Um, so let, let's just thank our audience here. Uh, you guys are great. We really appreciate you watching the episodes. We appreciate you sharing the episodes. And heartfelt from all of us, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Um, tomorrow is what it's all about. You know, the, uh, the darkness has light now. And uh, the, the light really... Um, it, it, it's winning. It's hard because the light has to do with the politics, but uh, the light will remain apolitical and it will remain very, uh, very bright. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton. This is the most wonderful night of the year, Christmas Eve. Jesus is about to be born. May he be born in us and revive his church. Happy Christmas. Mm -hmm.